Welcome to Balancing the Ledger, where tech and finance intersect. I'm Jen Vietchner. And I'm Jeff Roberts. And this week, we're joined by Kathleen Brightman, the co-founder of Tezos, a blockchain project that raised $232 million last summer. Thank you so much for being here, Kathleen. Thank you for having me. So tell us what exactly Tezos is and what it does. So Tezos is a smart contract in many ways akin to Ethereum. Um, but the core observation that led to Tezos's origination was in 2014, there was a lot of um, so-called altcoins uh, coming out that were basically forks of Bitcoin. And the argument at the time was that this was actually a good thing for Bitcoin, um, because after all, Bitcoin could always fold in the innovations that these altcoins were bringing to the market. Um, so that prompted a question of like, how? You know, Bitcoin lacks a formal uh, mechanism to upgrade itself. And so Tezos kind of hoped to solve this notion of um, how to upgrade a blockchain by creating a formal governance process around uh, figuring out which, which version of Tezos was the canonical one. Would it be right to say it's Tezos is sort of like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but with like political science and game theory baked into the protocol? Um, yeah, I, I would say that's like a, a, a fair characterization. And I think that, um, you know, to be honest, like there is sort of a governance mechanism in Bitcoin in Ethereum. It's just not as explicit as it is in Tezos. So drawing that out and forcing it to be in a sort of town square instead of through um, more implicit means is, is kind of what we're trying to do. Yeah, the town square means of governance is what you know part of what makes Tezos so unique. So how does, exactly does that work and what's different about it than the way Bitcoin's governance works, for example? Yeah, so um, I think the tagline for Tezos on the website is a digital commonwealth. And I like that because it's a very literal, <laughs> literal way of thinking about it. If you think of a blockchain as a shared resource among many different actors, um, a commonwealth is basically how do you maintain it? And so Tezos has a few interesting features, but I think the most prominent one is that it actually has a very meta way of upgrading its governance process and to experiment with um, how to allocate these resources and how to um, prune them and garden them, if you will, if you think about uh, shared resources like a park. You kind of get the consensus from the masses versus just having it be forcing the differences to go to a hard fork, for example, as we've seen with Bitcoin. So yeah, I mean, most blockchains come to consensus on what a valid transaction is. Um, Tezos goes one step further by actually having a consensus on which upgrades are valid. Um, I know there was some concern a few months back about centralization and that there's maybe a couple cabals that would have had an outsized power on the network. And I yeah. know this is a concern with all blockchains, but it sounds like you're sort of uh, addressing that or overcoming it. Yeah, well, I think the distribution of, um, of I guess, token holders in the network is remarkably even, even out in the, I think the average contribution to the Tezos fundraiser was around $1,000 to give you an idea. Um, and so that automatically like, kind of has an interesting distribution. It's very similar to the Gini coefficient in the United States, if you think about it. Um, but I think what we were mostly concerned with, just you know, we want to have this sort of decentralized digital commonwealth and, and to be able to imbue these principles, um, having people participate in the validation process. Um, so the people who are, are actually maintaining the ledger, um, it was a big concern. Um, but thankfully and remarkably, I think the software that's been um, made available to the public to participate in this process has been remarkably accessible um, to, the, to the extent that there's been um, uh, quite a few people sell, setting up services to delegate and receive delegation. Um, around 400 to 440 people are validating the network at any given cycle. And you're working on a new project yourself that will run on Tezos? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, um, my husband and I obviously are the co-founders of Tezos. Um, and so my husband's competency lies in contributing to the core protocol. Um, I'm going to use my you know, voice in the network to focus more on the application layer. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting um, problems in, in uh, the, the cryptocurrency space, but I think um, user design and interaction with smart contracts is, is one of the main ones. And um, I think online video games are actually a really interesting hook uh, to kind of uh, use cryptocurrencies more fruitfully. And so I'm exploring the tension with that in, in my next company. Um, but that's, that's all I have on paper now. Take us a year or two ahead. I mean, if Tezos really kind of gets going, what's, what are the going to be early killer apps on it? Yeah, so I mean, the reason I'm focusing on online video games is primarily because I think that the users of these games tend to have the right profile for adopting new digital paradigms. Um, so I'm going to try to lock in there and try to understand the user experience a bit more and hopefully create more tools that are more accessible for people using smart contracts, for example. Um, but ultimately, I think that these things are good for making transactions with people you don't necessarily know. Um, and so financial use cases obviously come to mind. Um, I think one application that I'd love to see in Ethereum or Tezos or whatever um, would be something like weather insurance, peer-to-peer um, -peer weather insurance, um, because you can use an outside oracle, but you, by and large, you can kind of um, model out the 
uh, information and you can imbue that in a smart contract really easily. A lot of the hype over the past few months has centered around whether Wall Street institutions are actually going to trade cryptocurrencies. Uh, and there was some news that really hurt the market this week with Goldman Sachs saying that they're not going to be opening a Bitcoin trading desk after all. What do you make of that news? Oh, well, that's just like the latest news in a series of, um, you know, kind of Bit the Bitcoin ETF, for example, was rejected um, a few weeks ago as well. So it's really been a, a bad uh, <laughs> series of uh, ser series of events. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm frankly, I was more surprised that Goldman was considering doing a, a, a Bitcoin trading desk. <laughs> and I'm, I'm fairly not surprised that, that didn't go through. Um, as far as I know, um, there's still a, a paucity of sophisticated actors who understand Bitcoin really well in these, in these Wall Street firms. Um, and so I'm not surprised that lacking you know, any good custody solution, for example, there wouldn't be a trading desk. Um, so there's a lot of baby steps for these institutions to really organize themselves and take the operational consideration seriously uh, to, to have these digital bearer assets uh, around floating around the bank. So it's uh, more of what I expected. The early days of Tezos was dominated by these weird headlines of this sort of like death match between you and your husband and this evil foundation head yeah. that was summarized in that uh, cover story in Wired. Part of the controversy, you'd raised hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, but, but people, there were questions around whether Tezos was actually going to launch. Now that it's launched, I mean, it sounds like you still have kind of enormous resources to play with. What can you do with those? So most of the money is still in Bitcoin, but it's still like a substantial amount of money that can be pledged towards Tezos projects. Um, I think to date, the Tezos Foundation has put around uh, $30 million in grants outside of the foundation towards different things like academic research. Um, but more importantly, and more dear to my heart, um, is community organizations from around the world. So I spent uh, uh, several days in Korea a few weeks ago, and I was really charmed at um, how enthusiastic and how passionate the Korean community was, even though I had never actually been to Korea before. Um, so it's very humbling and it's very endearing to see this type of um, grassroots organic uh, fanfare for, for Tezos sort of take root and uh, receive funding from an organization that was meant to endow this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's to the sort of credit of Tezos that you guys did kind of put your head down and finish this because there's a lot of skeptics, including me once upon a time. However, more broadly in the larger crypto world, I think what Jen might be getting at, there's a lot of people who suddenly have not just millions, but tens of millions or hundreds of millions of money, yeah. or, of dollars. And, you know, isn't it tempting sometimes just to go like rent Lambos and just goof around for a few years? And people sort of critique the the crypto world for that, with yeah. lack of any sort of VCs overseeing them, you know, no one is completing anything. So do you think that's a fair critique? And how did you go a different way? I mean, I still fly economy class, so clearly I'm doing something wrong. But um, <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of um, people who want to show off. And, and, and obviously, like, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you're going to rent a Lambo and park it outside of consensus, you're going to get a photo of you at a Lambo at consensus. I think that there's a certain degree of people who don't have um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of shame. Uh, you know, going out and doing very ostentatious things that they I would find in poor taste. Um, I think that just in general, that's kind of always been the case with like early ecosystems. You always get like these sort of bad boys and and people who pe people want to hold up as a pedestal of what's wrong with an industry. Um, and I think having ostentatious people who um, sort of do fly by night types of things um, profiled is, is the easiest way to do that if you're if you're looking at the space and you're trying to find a good bad guy. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm Jen Vietchner. And I'm Jeff Roberts. For more Balancing Ledger, please go to fortune.com. We'll see you next time. Yeah.